60 Great Ghost Stories, read by H. Washington Sawyer. Tonight's story, The Axe, by Penelope Fitzgerald. You will recall that when the planned redundancies became necessary as a result of the discouraging trading figures shown by the small firm, in contrast, so I gather from the company reports, with several of your other enterprises, you personally deputed to me the task of speaking to those who were to be asked to leave. It was suggested to me that if they were asked to resign in order to avoid the unpleasantness of being given their cards, it might be unnecessary for the firm to offer any compensation. Having glanced personally through my staff sheets, you underlined the names of four people, the first being that of my clerical assistant, W.S. Singleberry. Your actual words to me were that he seemed fairly old and could probably be frightened into taking a powder. You were speaking to me in your democratic style. From this point on, I feel able to write more freely, it being well understood at office managerial level that you do not read more than the first two sentences of any given report. You believe that anything which cannot be put into two sentences is not worth attending to, a piece of wisdom which you usually attribute to the late Lord Beaverbrook. As I question whether you have ever seen a Singleberry, with whom this report is mainly concerned, it may be helpful to describe him. He worked for the company for many more years than myself, and his attendance record was excellent. On Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, he wore a blue suit and a green knitted garment with a front zip. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, he wore a pair of grey trousers of man-made material, which he called my flannels, and a fawn cardigan. The cardigan was omitted in summer. He had, however, one distinguishing feature, very light blue eyes, with a defensive expression, as though apologizing for something which he felt very guilty about, but could not put right. The fact is that he was getting old. Getting old is, of course, a crime of which we grow more guilty every day. Singleberry had no wife or dependents, and was by no means a communicative man. His room is, or was, a kind of cubbyhole adjoining mine. You have to go through it to get into my room. It was always kept very neat. About his things... He did show some mild emotion. They had to be ranged in certain pattern in respect to his in and out trays, and Singleberry stayed behind for two or three minutes every evening to do this. He also managed to retain every year the complimentary desk calendar sent to us by Dino's, the Italian cafe on the corner. Singleberry was, in fact, the only one of my personnel who was always quite certain of the date. To this, too, his attitude was apologetic. His phrase was, I'm afraid it's Tuesday. His work, as was freely admitted, was his life, but the nature of his duties, though they included the post book and the addressograph, were rather hard to define having grown around him with the years. I can only say that after he left, I was surprised myself to discover how much he had had to do. Oddly connected in my mind with the matter of the redundancies is the irritation of the damp in the office this summer and the peculiar smell, not the ordinary smell of damp, emphasized by the sudden appearance of representatives of a firm of damp eliminators, who had not been sent for by me, nor is there any record of my having done so. These people simply vanished at the end of the day and have not returned. Another firm, 
to whom I applied as a result of frequent complaints by the female staff, have answered my letters but have so far failed to call. Singleberry remained unaffected by the smell, joining very much against his usual habit in one of the two frequent discussions of the subject. He said that he knew what it was. It was the smell of disappointment. For an awkward moment, I thought he must have found out by some means that he was going to be asked to go. But he went on to explain that in 1942, the whole building had been requisitioned by the Admiralty and that relatives had been allowed to wait or to queue there in the hope of getting news of those missing at sea. The repeated disappointment of these women, Singleberry said, must have permeated the building like a corrosive gas. All this was very unlike him. I made it a point not to encourage anything morbid. Singleberry was quite insistent. He added, as though by way of proof, that the lineo in the corridors was admiralty issue and had not been renewed since 1942 either. I was astonished to realize that he had been working in the building for so many years before the present tenancy. I realized that he must be considerably older than he had given us to understand. This, of course, will mean that there are wrong entries on his cards. The actual notification to the redundant staff passed off rather better, in a way, than I had anticipated. By that time, everyone in the office seemed inexplicably conversant with the details, and several of them, in fact, had gone far beyond their terms of reference. Young Patel, for instance, who openly admits that he will be leaving us as soon as he can get a better job, taking me aside and telling me that to such a man as Singleberry, dismissal would be like death. Dismissal is not the right word, I said. But death is, Patel replied. Singleberry himself, however, took it very quietly, even when I raised the question of the company's early retirement pension scheme, which I could not pretend was overgenerous, he said very little. He was generally felt to be in a state of shock. The two girls whom you asked me to speak to were quite unaffected, having already found themselves employment as hostesses at the Dolphinarium near here. Mrs. Horrocks of filing, on the other hand, did protest, and was so offensive on the question of severance pay that I was obliged to agree to refer it to a higher level. I consider this one of the hardest day's work I have ever done for the company. Just before this month's notice, if you are to call it that, was up, Singleberry, to my great surprise, asked me to come home with him one evening for a meal. In all the past years, the idea of his having a home, still less asking anyone back to it, had never arisen, and I did not at all want to go there now. I felt sure, too, that he would want to reopen the matter of compensation, and only a quite unjustified feeling of guilt made me accept. We took the underground together after work, traveling in the late rush hour to Clapham North, and walked some distance in the rain. His place, when we eventually got to it, seemed particularly inconvenient, the entrance being through a small cleaner's shop. It consisted of one room and a shared toilet on the half landing. The room itself was tidy, arranged, so it struck me, much on the lines of his cubbyhole, but the window was shut, and it was oppressively stuffy. This is where I bury myself, said Singleberry. There were no cooking arrangements, and he left me there while he went down to fetch us something ready to eat at the Stekorama next to the cleaners. In his absence, I took the opportunity to examine his room, though, of course, not in an inquisitive or prying manner. I was struck by the fact that none of his small store of stationery had been brought home from the office. He returned with two stakes, wrapped in aluminium foil, evidently a special treat in my honor. 
and afterwards we went out on the landing and made cocoa, a drink which I had not tasted for more than thirty years. The evening dragged, rather. In the course of conversation, it turned out that Shingleberry was fond of reading. There were, in fact, several issues of a color-printed encyclopedia, which he had been collecting as it came out, but unfortunately it had ceased publication after the seventh part. Reading is my hobby, he said. I pointed out that a hobby was rather something that one did with one's hands or in the open air, a relief from the work of the brain. Oh, I don't accept that distinction, Singleberry said. The mind and the body are the same. Well, one cannot deny the connection, I replied. Fear, for example, releases adrenaline, which directly affects the nerves. I don't mean connection. I mean identity, Singleberry said. The mind is the blood. Nonsense, I said. You might as well tell me that the blood is the mind. It stands to reason that blood can't think. I was right, after all, in thinking that he would refer to the matter of the redundancy. This was not until he was seeing me off at the bus stop, when for a moment he turned his grey, exposed-looking face away from me and said that he did not see how he could manage if he really had to go. He stood there like someone who has tried to give satisfaction. He even used this phrase, saying that if the expression were not redolent of a bygone age, he would like to feel that he had given satisfaction. Fortunately, we had not long to wait for the 45 bus. At the expiry of the month, the staff gave a small tea party for those who were leaving. I cannot describe this occasion as a success. The following Monday, I missed Singleberry as a familiar presence and also, as mentioned above, because I had never quite realized how much work he had been taking upon himself. As a direct consequence of losing him, I found myself having to stay late, not altogether unwillingly, since although following general instructions I have discouraged overtime, the extra pay in my own case would be instrumental in making ends meet. Meanwhile, Singleberry's desk had not been cleared, that is, of the trays, pencil sharpener, and complimentary calendar, which were, of course, office property. The feeling that he would come back, not like Mrs. Hart's, who has rung up and called round incessantly, but simply come back to work out of habit and through not knowing what else to do, was very strong, without being openly mentioned. I myself half expected and dreaded it, and I had mentally prepared two or three lines of argument in order to persuade him, if he did come, not to try it again. Nothing happened, however. On the Thursday, I personally removed the things from the cubbyhole into my own room. Meanwhile, in order to dispel certain quite unfounded rumors, I thought it best to issue a notice for general circulation, pointing out that if Mr. Singleberry should turn out to have taken any unwise step, and if, in consequence, any inquiry should be necessary, we would be the first to hear about it from the police. I dictated this to my only permanent typist, who immediately said, Oh, he would never do that. He would never cause any unpleasantness like bringing police into the place. He'd do all that he could to avoid that. I did not encourage any further discussion, but I asked my wife, who was very used to social work, to call round at Singleberry's place in Chapman North and find out how he was. She did not have very much luck. The people in the cleaner shop knew, or thought they knew, that he was away, but they had not been sufficiently interested to ask where he was going. On Friday, young Patel said that he would be leaving as the damp and the smell were affecting his health. The damp is certainly not drying out in this seasonably warm weather. I also, as you know, received another invitation on the Friday, at very short notice, in fact, no notice at all. 
I was told to come to your house in Suffolk Park Gardens that evening for drinks. I was not unduly elated, having been asked once before after I had done rather an awkward job for you. In our company, justice has not only not to be done, but it must be seen not to be done. The food was rather nice. It came from your caterer's grade three. I spent most of the evening talking to Ted Hallow, one of the area sales managers. I did not expect to be introduced to your wife, nor was I. Towards the end of the evening, you spoke to me for three minutes in a small room with a green marble floor and matching wallpaper leading to the ground floor toilets. You asked me if everything was all right, to which I replied, all right for whom? You said that nobody's fault was nobody's funeral, and I said that I had tried to give satisfaction. Passing on towards the wash basins, you told me with seeming cordiality to be careful and to watch it when I had had mixed drinks. I would describe my feeling at this point as resentment, and I cannot identify exactly the moment when it passed into unease. I do know that I was acutely uneasy as I crossed the hall and saw two of your domestic staff, a man and a woman, holding my coat, which I had left in the lobby, and apparently trying to brush it. Your domestic staff all appear to be of foreign extraction, and I personally feel sorry for them and do not grudge them a smile at the oddly assorted guests. Then I saw that they were not smiling at my coat, but that they seemed to be examining their fingers and looking at me earnestly and silently. And the collar or shoulders of my coat was covered with blood. As I came up to them, although they were still both absolutely silent, the illusion or impression passed, and I put on my coat and left the house in what I hoped was a normal manner. Now I come to the present time. The feeling of uneasiness which I described as making itself felt in your house has not diminished during this past weekend, and partly to take my mind off it, and partly for reasons I have given, I decided to work overtime again tonight, Monday the 23rd. This was in spite of the fact that the damp smell had become almost a stench, as of something putrid which must have affected my nerves to some extent, because when I went out to get something to eat at Dino's, I left the lights on, both in my office and in the entrance hall. I mean that for the first time since I began to work at the company, I left them on deliberately. As I walked to the corner, I looked back and saw the two solitary lights, looking somewhat forlorn in contrast to the glitter of the Arab-American Mutual Loan Corporation opposite. After my meal, I felt absolutely reluctant to go back to the building, and wished then that I had not given way to the impulse to leave the lights on. But, since I had done so, they must be turned off, I had no choice. As I stood in the empty hallway, I could hear the numerous creakings, settlings, and faint tickings of an old building, possibly associated with the plumbing system. The lifts, for reasons of economy, do not operate after 6.30 p.m., so I began to walk up the stairs. After one flight, I felt a strong creeping tension in the nerves of the back, such as any of us feel when there is danger from behind. One might say that the body is thinking for itself on these occasions. I did not look round, but simply continued upwards as rapidly as I could. At the third floor I paused, and could hear footsteps coming patiently up behind me. This was not a surprise, I had been expecting them all evening. Just at the door of my office, or rather of the cubbyhole, for I have to pass through that, I turned and saw at the end of the dim corridor what I had also expected, Singleberry, advancing towards me with his unmistakable shuffling step. My first reaction was a kind of bewilderment as to why he, 
who had been such an excellent timekeeper, so regular day by day, should become a creature of the night. He was wearing the blue suit. This I could make out by its familiar outline, but it was not till he came halfway down the corridor towards me and reached the patch of light falling through the window from the street that I saw that he was not himself. I mean, his head was nodding, or rather swiveling irregularly from side to side. It crossed my mind that Singleberry was drunk. I had never known him drunk, or indeed seen him take anything to drink, even at the office Christmas party. But one cannot estimate the effect trouble will have upon a man. I began to think what steps I should take in this situation. I turned on the light in his cubbyhole as I went through and waited at the entrance of my own office. As he appeared in the outer doorway, I saw that I had not been correct about the reason for the odd movement of the head. The throat was cut from ear to ear, so that the head was nearly severed from the shoulders. It was this which had given the impression of nodding, or rather lolling. As he walked into his cubby hole, Singleberry raised both hands and tried to steady the head, as though conscious that something was wrong. The eyes were thickly filmed over, as one sees in the carcasses in a butcher's shop. I shut and locked my door, and not wishing to give way to nausea or to lose all control of myself, I sat down at my desk. My work was waiting for me as I had left it. It was the file on the matter of the damp elimination, and there not being anything else to do, I tried to look through it. On the other side of the door, I could hear Singleberry sit down also, and then try the drawers of the table, evidently looking for the things without which he could not start work. After the drawers had been tried, one after another, several times, there was almost total silence. The present position is that I am locked in my office, and would not, no matter what you offered me, indeed I could not go out through the cubbyhole and pass what is sitting at the desk. The early cleaners will not be here for seven hours and forty-five minutes. I have passed the time so far as best I could in writing this report. One consideration strikes me. If what I have next door is a visitant which should not be walking but buried in the earth, then its wound cannot bleed, and there will be no stream of blood moving slowly under the whole width of the communicating door. However, I am sitting at the moment with my back to the door, so that, without turning round, I have no means of telling whether it has done so or not. 